Hello everyone. So we are still in chapter four looking at learner diversity and focusing on gender. This is part two for gender. So where we left off, we were getting ready to talk about how we can explain some of these gender differences that we saw in the first part. So in the first part, we were looking at differences in play and friendship and behavior and academics. Well, now let's try to see perhaps where some of those differences come from. So I thought I'd ask a question of you. What do you think is more important in gender development? Nature. So nature is biology, your genetics, what you inherit from your parents. Or nurture, which is the environment that you grow up in. Nature, nurture, which one's more important? Well, they both play a pretty critical role. We are going to be looking at this pretty briefly, um, but let's take a look. So, when it comes to nature versus nurture, let's start by looking at biology, which is the nature side. So, we do know that genetics, um, through the mechanism of our hormones, do play a large role. And things like hormones determine certain physiological differences. One of the ones that's really striking and easy to see is body shape and size and the changes that go along with puberty. So when you compare males and females, if you see these two pictures here, you'll notice females tend to have what we call an hourglass figure. Males tend to have a upside down triangle figure. Those bodily shapes begin at puberty and are uh, put into motion from our hormones. Before that, we're all pretty much straight up and down. <laughs> So again, there are a lot of physical changes that occur due to our biology. Um, also, some behavioral differences we believe are also connected to biology, such as differences in aggression. Um, um, so with differences in aggression and preference for that stereotypical play, that is something that we find around the globe. Rural, urban, um, third world countries, everywhere. So because it is something that is a universal finding, we believe it to be strongly biological in origin because the environment is so different in all those situations, but we still see boys are more active, boys are more aggressive, boys play, um, has the same characteristics. Um, and another one, we also think that verbal skills has a little bit of a biological role as well, based on the studies that have been done. I won't go into all the details. But we do know gender is definitely not all about biology. Um, here's a quick video just showing you some, uh, just looking at gender from a cultural perspective, looking at how children in other countries view gender. So let's begin. Um, my name is Hilti Kate Lisak. I'm nine years old. And I'm nine years old. The best thing about being a boy is like a boy is very sporty. The best thing being a girl is, be is because that girls can do a little bit more things than boys can. The best thing about being a girl is now I don't have to pretend to be a boy. Before I transitioned, I was just pretending to be a boy, but now I'm a girl and I'm a lot happier. The worst thing about being a girl is that you just can't do things that boys can do. The worst thing about being a boy is you're under armpit sticks. Like, it kind of bothers me how there, there was not one girl president. One thing I wish I could do when I can because I'm a girl is I can't be treated like I wanted to. From the ground, if you fall down, you'll get hurt. If you're skinny, you'll get hurt. If you're skinny, you'll get hurt. If I was a girl, my life would be very strange and odd. Well, I wouldn't be one of those fancy girls, I would mm -hmm. just be like a tomboy. The hair always comes in my face. It would be very, very irritating with the long hair. Mm -hmm. 
All right, we'll stop there. But you can see again that there's a lot of different views on gender differences based upon where you where you're raised. So speaking of where you're raised, let's take a look now at, and I'll get my laser pointer back out. Let's take a look at nurture. So in terms of environmental differences, there are a couple of key ways that we believe that these gender differences occur. One is that simply parents treat boys and girls differently. Adults treat boys and girls differently. So if we are treating children one way, they're going to start to act in accordance with how they're treated. Let me give you an example. So there's a fairly famous research study that was done and it involved having adults describe and answer questions about a child. So they would bring in a small infant dressed perhaps similarly to this and they would ask the adults what words would you use to describe this infant? And you can see some of the choices. Firm, soft, big, little, strong, weak, hearty, delicate, and so on. And then some of the adults saw this child and some of the adults saw this child. Now here's the kicker in this study. It was the same baby. Okay, so again, in infants, you can't see a lot of physical differences between boys and girls. So they took the same baby. Half the adults saw the baby dressed in boy, typical boy clothes. Half the adults saw the baby dressed in typical girl clothes. They used completely different adjectives to describe this very same baby, just simply based upon the clothes the baby had on and then the assumptions they made about what gender the baby was and how they should treat that baby. They then also asked follow-up questions. What type of clothes would you buy this child? What birthday gifts would you give? Which infant would you compliment on their looks? And which infant would you play with? And studies have found that uh, in these types of studies and also in home and naturalistic observation studies, when adults interact with a girl, one of the first things they do is they tell her how pretty she is. Um, and one of the first things they do with a boy is they pick him up and play rough with him. So there has to be a little bit of an environmental um, influence in some of these early gender differences. So to relate this to my own personal life, this is a picture from my niece and nephew's birthday. I'm thinking it was their third birthday. They are twins. And uh, I recall when they were opening up their presents, so the little girl, Katie, got a dress up set. And when she opened it up, she was so excited and she put on all of her dress up clothes and just kind of, you know, marched all around the house like that. And then my little nephew, Christian, got a Nerf ball set with a basketball and a football and so on. And so he started playing with the balls. So there's one parental difference. Um in terms of treatment, the types of presents they received. Then a little bit later during the party, I noticed how differently we also treated the children in our family. At that point in our time, we had one little girl in our family and she sat there on the floor with the other women and, you know, was quiet. And all the boys were in another like corner of the room, just piling on and playing and playing rough. So very different in terms of their treatment and their social interaction. Okay, so that is one of the things that might be causing some of these gender differences. And next is also that the children themselves get reinforced for gender stereotypical behavior. So when we see the little girl dress up in her tiara and her shoes, we all, oh, that's so cute, and we tell her how pretty she looks. And when we see the boys playing rough, we encourage that as well. So we are reinforcing the things that we want to see when we see them behave that way. Now, this is a cute video. You might have seen it. It hit the um, social media circuit a couple of years ago, but it fits this um, idea. Okay, let me try to start that again. You're not a single lady, buddy. <laughs> there you are. There you are. You're a single lady. Oh. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, buddy. I was just kidding. 
I'm just you kidding. Can do it. You can do it. <laughs> buddy, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, buddy. But you're a single lady, okay? Okay? Here we go. If you like it, then you get a better ring on it. Sorry. Did that hurt your feelings? You can be a single lady. So, you know, at least at the end, he's trying to make light of it and does recognize the mistake that he made. But you can see how little things like that add up and how it's a cumulative effect, perhaps, on our idea of what boys and girls should and shouldn't do and what gets reinforced and what gets punished. All right, so let's get to, so that was just looking at nature versus nurture, the origins of some of this. Let's get a tad more specific when it comes to theories of gender development, but again, we're still just going to be scratching the surface here. Uh, social learning theory. We do have an entire chapter coming up in the future where we're going to be focusing on social learning, but for now, just know the way this affects gender is kids learn gender roles by observing adults and imitating them. And who are the adults that they are around the most? Their parents. So, little girls watch their moms and they imitate what they see. Little boys watch their dads and they imitate what they see. So, if you grew up in a traditional home and you had both a mom and a dad or a male and female caregiver in your home, we can't do hands up because we're at home, but just think to yourself, how many of you growing up, um... Did your mom be the person who was in charge of laundry? I gotta raise my hand for that one. Uh, for how many of you was your dad in charge of mowing the lawn? Okay, how about your mom in charge of cooking dinner? And perhaps your dad was in charge of taking out the trash. You can start to see, even when we growing up, looking at your parents, you see gender stereotypical behaviors. You observe that and you imitate that. Girls start to think, okay, I need to do what mom's doing. Boys start to think, I need to do what dad's doing. That's social learning theory. Now, social learning theory so far, I've just been saying adults, specifically parents. Social learning theory applies to any model that you're observing, and that can also include people on TV. So let's think about Disney for a moment. How does Disney portray females? And how many little girls do you know love Disney princesses and, you know, get the costumes and the tiaras and want to imitate what they see? Okay, and then how does Disney portray males? We're going to watch a short video talking a little bit about this difference. How many Disney movies did you see as a child? How many times did you watch your favorite one? And how many of those songs can you still sing all the lyrics to? The way the media influences the way we think is much less immediate and much less a sort of uh, straightforward impact on the way we think. And it's much more a, a question of creating a certain environment of images that we grow up in and that we become used to. And after a while, those images will begin to shape what we know and what we understand about the world. And that's not an immediate kind of whiz-bang effect. That's a slow, accumulative effect, and it's much more subtle. Let's take a look-see. Hate your hair. Not likely. Yikes. 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 And let me guess, you have a great personality. <laughs> Most Disney movies revolve around a heterosexual relationship between a hero and a heroine. Feminists have studied what these relationships tell girls about themselves, but it is just as important to think about what they tell boys about how real men interact with and think about women. Often, the message to boys, both implicitly and explicitly, is that men should view women as objects of pleasure or as servants to please them. Disney movies glorify one particular body type above all others. Chiseled abs, a barrel chest, and massive arms. Like Men with any other body type in Disney movies are generally outcasts or weak and subservient. One of the most extreme examples is the contrast between the very powerful Gaston and the bumbling LeFou in Beauty and the Beast. Nobody. Oh, there's no one as girly and brawny. As you see, 
I've got biceps to spare. Not a bit of him scraggly or scrawny. That's right. And every last inch of me's covered with hair. Okay, so we'll stop there. But I think if you've seen a few Disney movies, you can see, again, how these little things can, again, have a cumulative effect on your mental image and your cognitions regarding gender. Um, also, I'd like to apologize if there are some bangs and louder noises in this video. I'm currently in a hotel room on vacation with my daughter, and the room up above me is a bit noisy. Okay, so social learning theory we saw. Now, gender schema theory. So the way gender schema theory works is children form these mental categories, which we call mental schemas, um, that contain ideas for them of what is masculinity and what is femininity. Uh, and they get these ideas from their culture. Okay, so in gender schema theory, um, a boy and a girl's mental cognitions or gender schema about gender will differ from one culture to another. Then they recognize their own gender role. So they recognize, okay, I'm a boy. Girls recognize they're a girl. And then they decide, okay, so this is how I should act. Well, that makes sense. So let's take this for girls. Since, you know, obviously um, I have a daughter and being a girl, I can relate to that a bit more. So you grow up and you watch Disney princess movies when you're very young. And you see that they wear beautiful gowns. They're somewhat delicate. They usually need to be saved in some way. They're going to be saved by a male. Um, and that they are, you know, fancy in a variety of ways. Then they reach that age where they recognize, oh, I'm a girl. Okay, so if I'm a girl, then this is how I should act. And all the little things that they've seen that to them say femininity, that takes on, or in some way influences their behavior. Think about all the things that we're presented with as children that can form our mental schemas about gender. So this little book right here, Little Mommy, my sister actually bought that book for my daughter and I have to admit I was a tiny bit horrified and I didn't give it to her because I thought, oh my gosh, really? She's she was five years old at the time. Do I really need to start telling her how she's going to grow up and be a mommy? Um, and then you can also see that how different that is from the type of books from the same time period that were made for little boys. Walk down Walmart toy aisle and you will see the striking difference. The pink row with all the dolls and the glitter and the hair bows and the cute little animals for girls. The mainly blue, but usually sometimes a little bit of red or yellow too, the action figures, the cars, and so on for boys. I mean, I see example after example of this when I go to toy stores. Uh, these were two dolls of similar size for boys and girls. So check this one out. She's a bride and she, uh, mine to love. Um, and here for, and then Buzz Lightyear, you know, who has wings that pop out and he talks and things very different in terms of how you would play with these two dolls and the message that they're sending. Okay, so the way gender schema theory works. Here's an example. Um, let's go through this. So, the child approaches the toys. It could be toys in a toy store. It could be toys in your classroom. And they consciously or unconsciously ask himself, who is this toy for? Boys, or is it for girls? Let's say this is a girl we're talking about. She says, I am a girl. So is it relevant to me? If she labels it as a boy toy, she'd say it's not for me. Therefore, she's going to avoid it. If she says, oh, it is for me, she assigns it to some sort of a category. It is a doll. It is a plush animal. It is a stuffed animal, whatever. And then it all starts over again. So you can see how this works. Let me get my cursor. There we go. So to compare the two, they do have a bit of similarities, but so social learning theory, you observe role models in your life and you imitate them. You also see the role of rewards and punishments here, whether you're, you know, looking at role models and seeing whether they're rewarded for their characteristics or not. And then that leads to your gender type behavior. 
gender schema theory. All right, so first of all, it does differ based upon the culture that you're in. Your gender schema is created as you look around the world and through this gender lens that you have. And then that creates this organized thinking that you have based around your categories, your mental schemas of gender, which then causes that gender type behavior. So, oh, sorry, moving along. Uh, we've got two topics left. I want to talk about gender spectrum. It was not mentioned much at all in your book, but I wanted to bring in a couple of resources and then also tie everything we've talked about so far in gender together with some teaching tips. Let's unpack this whole gender conversation. Um, you use a device or a character called the gender bread man. Person. To, oh, sorry. Oh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> the gender bread person. It's okay. I found it really helpful to think about gender in a few different distinct categories. Gender identity, how you define your gender and how you see yourself. Gender expression, the different ways that we present or perform gender through our actions, our dress and our demeanor. And biological sex or anatomical sex, the physical characteristics that make up our body that in many people's minds um, equal gender. But don't. So gender expression is the way you present yourself to the world. So you could be talking about the way you dress, yeah. uh, the way you comb your hair or, or, don't. or use product. Yeah. So everything kind of as it relates to the outside world, Yeah, right? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a perfect way of thinking about it. So even just, okay, so <laughs> this is funny. The way that I'm sitting right now is a very feminine expression of sitting, because like how we sit is gendered, right? And meanwhile, I'm kind of man-spreading. Yeah, you're man-spreading. <laughs> <laughs> You're not even giving me enough room to properly manspread over here. <laughs> this is the man cross, the, the masculine way of crossing a leg. This is just uncomfortable for me. It feels it's, like it so feels much. It feels good to me. Yeah? Yeah, it's like yoga. <laughs> okay, legs. now let's okay. do the girl. Okay. So gender is different than sexual orientation. Yeah. But a lot of people get them confused. Yeah. Gender is who you go to bed as. Sexual orientation is who you go to bed with. Got so it. if you haven't heard that one, that one's important. So let's talk about penises and vaginas, shall we? <laughs> yeah, we might as well. <laughs> let's if just you, go right if there. If you haven't already talked about penises and vaginas, we need to talk about penises and vaginas. Because that's what everybody always thinks. Like immediately, as soon as you say gender, anybody who's walking by right now who's hearing us say the word gender, the first thing that's popping into their mind is external genitalia. They're thinking about penises and vaginas. So for the purpose of our discussion, the bottom line is your external genitalia does not dictate your gender. Yeah. Wait a second, can you rewind that? The bottom line is your external genitalia does not dictate your gender. Yeah, I mean that, that I couldn't have said it better. Okay, so let's take a look. So they were talking about the gender, gender, gingerbread person. I've got the gender unicorn. We saw the gingerbread one earlier. So gender unicorn, again, gender, gender identity is up here in your head, your mental schema, um, your psychological perspective on who you are and what gender you are. Okay, so gender identity in the mind. Gender expression, how you present yourself to the outside world. Um, then we have sex down here, which is your external genitalia. Uh, then we have here, who you're sexually attracted to in the heart and then also connected to romantically or emotionally attracted to and the idea that each of these categories are independent from one another uh, this is perhaps a more simplified way of viewing it looking at gender versus sex and then expression versus orientation so you're going to have a variety of students in your classroom. So chapter four, we've looked at socioeconomic status. Uh, we've looked at boys versus girls. Um, in your 2020 class, you're going to look at multicultural differences. Uh, we'll eventually be looking at English as a second language. So a lot of differences in your students. Uh, so some things you want to keep in mind. Your LGBTQ students are going to have some struggles because they're going to feel and they might actually be rejected by their peers. They're going to have some issues that your other students don't have to deal with, such as 
over here, this um, chart that I found from some study comparing your LGBTQ students to your non students. So 26% of LGBT youth say that their biggest problem is not about being accepted by their family, but it's about trouble at school. Um, whereas 22% of the non LGBT youth say that their biggest problem is exams and studying. So as a teacher, you tend to be focused on exams and studying and grades and homework, and you think that that could be one of the, the major um, stressors or concerns of your students. Your LGBT students have different obstacles, you know, again, being worried about being rejected by their peers, um, or perhaps actually being rejected by their peers. Uh, because of this, you're going to see higher instances of depression in these students. They might also be withdrawn. They're going to perhaps feel alienated or isolated or excluded. Um, this can in turn cause some behavior issues where they might turn to drugs or alcohol as a way of dealing with these feelings, which can be overwhelming for children, for teens. Uh, here's some data I want to show you from a fairly recent study. Uh, this is the <clears throat> HRC Foundation. It's the largest study of this kind, 12,000 LGBTQ teenagers. And they just wanted to look at the daily life, daily life and struggles of these students, ages 13 to 17, all states. And they found these students are experiencing extreme levels of stress, anxiety, rejection, and also feeling unsafe in their own classrooms. Uh, some other findings that they had. 77% of them feeling depressed just in the past week from when the survey was done. Um, having great difficulty sleeping at night, you know, let alone all the things that go along with sleep deprivation. Um, let's see what else. You can also see that a large majority, 70%, report feelings of worthlessness and hopelessness, which does go hand in hand with feelings of depression. And one of the st statistics that really stood out to me was down here. Only 5% of these 12 thousand LGBTQ students said that all of their teachers and school staff were supportive. That to me is quite a sad statistic and shows that in schools we could be doing much better. All of our students need to feel safe and included in our classroom. Uh, there's a couple of terms I want to go over under gender spectrum uh, and that is the distinction between transgender and transsexual. So transgender an individual who identifies both emotionally and psychologically with the opposite sex. So they may be born a male, but they simply feel and think and um, that they are a female. That is similar to, but transsexual is kind of the next step from that. This is an individual who wants to live as a member of the opposite sex that they were born with. So the most famous um, individual that I can think of is Bruce Jenner, who now goes by Caitlyn Jenner. This is someone who wants to actually transition and live their life as the opposite sex. Now you might be thinking, well, this is something that really only the high school teachers need to think about, and that is not accurate. Um, my sister-in-law is a kindergarten teacher, and a couple of years ago, I know that she had a young um biological male in her class who considered himself transgender and she had a conversation with the mother and talked about the name that the young boy wanted to go by and the type of dress that he was going to wear by dress I mean apparel so this is something that can affect all teachers and you need, need to be prepared to help these students feel included and welcome in your class so just a question to put out there what are some things you can do to ma have an inclusive classroom so that again, all of your students feel welcomed and loved and cared for by not just you, but by the entire class community. To be honest, this is something that teachers struggle with. And it's something that I think we need to really put some thought into. Now, our last segment is covering teaching tips. And this is not just for specifically looking at gender spectrum issues where we last left off. This is looking across the board for chapter four within the topic of gender. So teaching tips. 
First of all, you want to take the research findings that are out there and use it to create equity in your classroom, not to form a stereotype or an expectation. So for instance, previously I talked about how males tend to score better in math and science and females tend to do so in the English language arts. That doesn't mean that you walk into um, your grammar class for the day and assume that your females are going to do better. Or when you're grading papers, you see a female name and you go, oh, she's probably going to get an A. And you see a male name and you go, oh, he's probably going to struggle, struggle. I really need to read this one. That is not at all what I'm talking about. You use that research to create equity. So you think in that English language arts class, what can I do to help my boys to scaffold their learning? You walk into your math and science class and you think the same thing for your girls. You monitor your own behaviors. Check yourself <laughs> to make sure that you yourself are not showing gender bias. Um, so here's a, a, an example I want to show. So this is a, a tweet. Uh, my nine-year-old started keeping a tally of how many girls versus boys get called on during her Zoom math class. The reason I wanted to show this is kids do notice bias. Now, there's not a huge bias being shown here. I mean, it looks like it's about, what, 11 to 15. But still, kids will pick up on these subtle differences in treatment. So, monitor your own behavior. Next. Think about all the models you present in your class, because what do you know about social learning theory? Children will observe and imitate their same-sex model. So try to present non-stereotypical role models. Think about what we learned from those Disney movies. Uh, here's another one. Don't just correct. When you, when you hear a stereotypical view or when you hear anything that sounds in any way like um, a gender bias statement or even something that borderlines on harassment, okay? Don't just correct it. Challenge those students. Educate those students. So, for instance, if here you hear a student say that boys can't wear a pink shirt, don't just say, of course boys can wear pink. Ask them, why do you think that? Um, who made that rule? Where did that come from? Um, why would pink be a color for one sex and not another? An interesting fact, pre-World War I, I think it was, boys were actually dressed in pink. It was considered to be a masculine color. It wasn't for some reason until after one of these major wars that, this, that there was a cultural shift and pink became a female color. But anyway, that could be an interesting history lesson. Um, if you hear students say that's so gay, don't just say, we don't use that word or don't talk like that. Ask them, what does that word mean? Um, how do you think that might make someone feel? You know, really get them to think about it. The point is to help them with perspective taking, to help them think about their assumptions they might have, and also the effect of their words on others. Watch your own language. Avoid using labels when at all possible. So try to avoid gender-specific language when you can. Um, so if you say boys line up over here, girls line up over here, that might leave a student or two in your class feeling awkward or uncomfortable. Is there another way you can do it? And first of all, why would you split the class on gender anyway? But um, discuss with students their preferred names and or preferred pronouns. Consider reading gender inclusive books. There are a lot of great ones out there. Um, there are some wonderful websites and Pinterest sites that give all sorts of examples at different grade levels of different um, gender inclusive books that are out there. Uh, I wanted to point this out just to show that this is actually something that is not as common as you might think. So the percent of students taught at an LGBT inclusive curriculum. Um, that was only about 20% of students in this particular survey and it was a large survey. So it is not widespread that we have an LGBTQ plus uh, inclusive curriculum out there, but it's something you might want to consider. Now, I do want to point out, because I do like to present things from different points of view, um, if any of you plan on working in a private institution after you graduate, they might have different rules, especially if it is a religious private institution. 
Catholic educational institutions work by a different set of guidelines. Um, so for instance, for them, this is a statement that I found from one of the sites. They, um, the moral issue for Catholic schools is that they cannot participate in or promote the, the denial or perceived denial of the biological sex with which the child had been endowed by the Creator. So if you're working in a private institution, you may not, um, not only would this, the use of preferred pronouns not be endorsed, it might be something that is not perhaps even allowed at the school. Teaching tips. So stock your classroom with a variety of toys, a variety of activities. Think about this with the books that you choose. Think about this with the assignments that you give. Make sure that it is um, inc inclusive of all. Remember that video about the war on boys. So if all of your poetry examples in class are about heartfelt, meaningful glimpses into the heart, that's not really going to reach your boys. Um, so make sure that you have assignments that are going to reach all of your students and toys that are going to work with all of your students. Uh, when it comes to seating your students, be intentional. Don't just let students take any seat. Don't even just do alphabetic order. Really be thoughtful about where your students are seated and have it be in a way that's going to be helpful to all of your students. Um, it is common for boys to sit together, girls to sit together, boys to choose boyfriends, girls to choose girlfriends. You're going to want to have a dynamic classroom. Um, I even recommend perhaps once a month completely changing your seating so that people sit with different students and make different friends. But think about your seating chart in relation to how this can be helpful to your class. Uh, and you also want to certainly be aware of laws and school policies regarding gender. You want to know what it is you should be following. For instance, you might have heard that recently an executive order was signed uh, preventing discrimination on the basis of gender identity or sexual orientation. After that executive order was signed, I saw a lot of posts on social media talking about how this order related to high school sports and that uh, transgender or transsexual boys would now be participating in girls sports and how this was the end of girl sports. So that was how I first heard about this executive order. I like to go to the source. I pulled up the executive order and read it. There is not one single statement in that executive order about high school sports. Now, granted, it could be used as a basis for an argument. It would have to be a legal argument because there is nothing in there that really talks about um, how that relates to sports in any way. It is simply to prohibit discrimination. So that's it. Um, I hope that you found this informative or helpful, or perhaps it reinforced things that you already knew about gender, but that is it for this part of chapter four. Thank you for your attention.